Hello, hello, my panda pals, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we are gonna be covering part two of what happened on Before the 90 Days. So sit down and let's get right into it. Let's check in with Tiger Lily and Adnan. The soon-to-be newlyweds head inside and Tiger Lily finally gets to meet Adnan's brothers and mother. Hello. I sneak in. I do think it's a little weird that everyone on Adnan's side is super totally fine with this marriage. I mean, his mom is like, I was a little shocked that he wanted to marry someone so soon, but I support him. Everyone heads inside for the marriage contract to be signed and Tiger Lily has no real idea what the hell is going on. I'm definitely not following all that's going on. She tells us that she has no clue what is happening. She does not know what the contract she's signing says. She doesn't know anything about Muslim culture, but when her gut says it's right, it's right. My gut is telling me Adnan is the one, so I am just going to follow my heart and get married. They exchange rings and Adnan immediately whisks her away to the hotel to whip out his ding ling and lose his virginity. Leave me. We have a privacy here. Good night. Adnan wakes up the next day, finally a fully fledged man, and he tells us that he can't go into detail, which we are eternally grateful for. There is nothing we need to work on. It was sweet, romantic. Right now, I don't even know how I'm standing. Happy she's happy, but ew. The two get up to get ready for Tiger Lily to meet the rest of Adnan's family. She told her glam squad to take the day off so that they could be well rested for the wedding tomorrow. So today, she called in a random hairstylist and big surprise, it is a man. And bigger surprise, Adnan is really mad about it. This is hair stylish? Yes. Why a guy? Why not woman? This is not acceptable. Adnan tells us that he is fine with Cruz because he's basically her brother, but he will not allow any other man to touch Tiger Lily. Listen, I get it. Your religion says that no man should ever touch your lady all willy nilly, but my guy, he is a stylist here to do her hair, not strap you to a chair and make you a cuck. Adnan starts pouting and he's like, I don't want him to touch you. And she's like, well, I can't really go and meet your family with your son just fucked the crap out of me hair. So I don't know, suck it up maybe? And Adnan continues pouting and he's like, fine, he can touch your hair, but I'm gonna be here watching. And so he just stands there and stares a hole into this man as he tries to do his job. Why do you keep giving him death glares? Tiger Lily tells him that he's being ridiculous and Adnan responds to that by setting a timer for five minutes on his phone and says that her hair better be done by then cause that is all the time the stylist is gonna get. Didn't want me around guys as friends. I didn't know that he met every guy anywhere. Adnan then waves the phone in the air and he's like, time, it's time. And Tiger Lily is probably like, mm, maybe marrying a child was a bad idea. The two head out and thank goodness we went through all of that stress with a man touching her hair cause look at these beautiful curls. They were totally worth it. Tiger Lily sees a group of women wearing niqabs and she's a little confused as to why Muslim women wear clothing with varying levels of modesty. And it not tells her that in his religion, when women are more conservative, it shows more respect. So you're okay with me showing all my hair? <laughs> yeah. That was convincing. She tells us that things have been moving so quickly that she hasn't had a single moment to look up anything about being Muslim. And even though Adnan has told her that he does not expect her to convert, she will eventually have the energy to do a few Google searches to quench her very clear thirst for this knowledge. Tiger Lily meets everyone, and while it is very overwhelming to meet so many new people at once, everyone at the party is incredibly kind and welcoming to her. They sit her down, they shovel a whole bunch of food on a plate, and this little baby bird does her best to enjoy it despite clearly not liking it at all. Meat and rice squished together like this in my mouth. You don't like it? No. Baby, I'm so sorry, I don't know. That is not surprising considering you guys do not seem to know anything about each other. One of his brothers pulls them aside to ask what their plans are after marriage. Will Adnan go to America or will she stay in Jordan? Please stay here. My two children are in the US. I need him to come to me. 
Tiger Lily was already concerned, but her concerns continue to grow with this conversation because she doesn't really understand why Adnan wouldn't tell his family about their plans for him to move to the US to be with her. Let's check in with Brian and Ingrid. Brian is finally with the woman that he can see himself spending the rest of his life with. And he gets Ingrid down on her knees in her pretty little black dress so that she can install the metal mechanism into their rental car that will allow him to drive them around for some reason. I don't know why he did that. I don't know why he chose that. He should have hired a taxi if Ingrid could not drive. I was here with Brian, but I was surprised that he asked me to install the control in the car. She is a little surprised because she was under the impression that Brian would be very independent and self-sufficient. Which isn't surprising that she thought that because Brian consistently tells her he can do anything a non-disabled person can do, except he just does it in a wheelchair. They arrive at the hotel and Ingrid goes to hop in the shower. Brian is tired, but he pops half a blue boner pill just in case. He says that even though he doesn't have much sensation below the belt, he still considers sexual intimacy incredibly important because it does make him feel wanted and desired. She's never had sex with someone in a wheelchair. It'll take some getting used to, obviously, but I hope she can keep an open mind about it because I really want that connection with her. Brian hops into the shower next and has Ingrid help him undress. He says that despite being able to do all of this stuff alone, he does like to test new partners from time to time to gauge their patience and willingness and also normalize his disability as quickly as possible. I do think that it's a good idea to normalize the disability as soon as possible, but I think Brian is doing it way too soon and way too aggressively. Ingrid cuddles up in bed and she hears Brian tugging his tiger. And she's like, sir, what is going on in there? And he yells out to her to say that he has to give himself a slight stiffy in order to use a catheter that basically allows him to pee. Brian gets out of the shower and hands Ingrid the catheter instructions almost as a way of saying like, hey, here are the instructions. You're going to have to do this for me in the future. So read up and study. It's a bit strange, right? On the first day, a few hours later, Brian can definitely sense that Ingrid is very uncomfortable, and he worries that he exposed too much too soon, and the two just end up cuddling in bed and going to sleep. I don't know how to feel about these two because, I mean, she's 20 years younger than him, which I think is a little weird. And he kind of made it sound like she was going to be hands off. He doesn't really need any help. But then the first hour that they meet in person, he's kind of nonstop about, can you help me do this? Can you do this? Can you do this? I need that. Can you help me do this? And that's probably incredibly overwhelming for her. And there's a part of me that understands wanting to normalize the disability. But there's another part of me that's like, I don't understand why you have to test her like this. I don't know. It feels a little manipulative and like seeing how far you can push her comfort or her boundaries or like see how much you can get away with. Ugh, I don't know, this interaction. I can understand why a lot of his previous relationships have failed if this is how he handles teaching them about his day-to-day -day life and his needs. Let's meet Sunny and Vea. Say hello to Sunny, a 25-year-old Bangladeshi living in South Africa. Sunny tells us that he is super shy and has only ever had one girlfriend in Africa. And when that did not work out, he decided to download an international dating app where he met the lady of his dreams. I like how most people try to date and fail multiple times before they think, well, the people in this culture don't really like me. So let's see if I can find someone in another country that'll be able to tolerate me. And Sunny did that just after a single attempt. Meet his lady love, Via. Via is 27 and she lives in Florida. Sunny fell in love with Via because she has big, pretty eyeballs and edgy hair. She was looking so beautiful because she had two colors of hair. She's like too good to be true. I couldn't believe that's the real. I mean, sure, she exists, like she's a real person, but holy moly, those filters are blurring her face into oblivion. Sunny is preparing for Via's upcoming visit, and while he is super excited, he's also very nervous because they come from such different cultural backgrounds. He tells his best bud Ali that they love each other and they're so comfortable with each other, and they both have daddy issues, so they understand each other. 
Ali reminds Sonny that during their last blowout fight, he said things like, oh, I don't even want her anymore. But you fight so many times with her. Yeah, last time you told me I fought her and I don't happen. need her. I don't want her anymore. And Sonny looks at him and he's like, oh, yeah, I did say that. I mean, I love her, but sometimes I just can't trust that bitch. Sometimes I can't trust her. Sometimes she doesn't pick up my phone calls. And yes, while I do think that you saying you do not trust someone because they do not answer your call once in a while is crazy, Sonny does go on to tell us that he gets insanely jealous and insecure because Via is still very good friends with one of her ex-boyfriends. They're so friendly. Even when their relationship get broke up, doesn't make sense to me. If things work out, I wanted to propose her when she's here. Ali tells us that Via may be able to do whatever the fuck she wants in America, but she will not be able to do that here if she wants this relationship with Sunny to work. Over in Florida, we get to meet Via. And yes, you should absolutely tone it down with those filters. You are a beautiful woman and those photos look nothing like you. Stop it. Angela needs those filters. You do not. Via has never been out of the country and she is very excited, but also super anxious. She did not even know that different countries had different outlet plugs. She tells her friends that she thinks Sunny is the one, but they've also had a lot of fights and issues with jealousy. For example, Sunny tracks her phone and accused her of cheating when she was just at a friend's house. So needless to say, she is a little nervous because if they get into a fight while she's over there, she won't have anyone there to support her. So to combat this, she thought it was a brilliant idea to invite her ex-boyfriend to keep her company. I ended up inviting Rory. Your ex? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't it be my first choice to bring your ex? Via tells her that her and Rory the ex dated for two years, but they had an amicable breakup because they both just wanted different things in life and decided to stay friends. And while I do think that in some cases, exes can genuinely just be friends, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that this is not one of those cases. And even if I'm wrong and they are 100% platonic, I still would not bring your ex-boyfriend to meet your incredibly insecure and insanely jealous boyfriend. That just seems like a no-no combo. Via then tells us that when she told Rory about Sunny, Rory decided to go onto Sunny's social media and comment ha-ha and laughing emojis under a lot of his pictures. Rory said that he just, he didn't understand why a dude would be in the mirror taking so many pictures. Okay, so it sounds like Via wanted to break up and Rory did not want that, but he also didn't want to lose Via. So he was like, oh my God, yeah, I totally feel the same. Let's just be friends. I'm so not still in love with you. And then he's just gonna carry an engagement ring in the back of his pocket forever and then follow her around so that any other future potential partner that she comes into contact with, he can just go ahead and ward off. And then in like eight years, when she's really tired and broken down from all of the failed attempts at finding a partner, she looks at him and he starts looking like a really good option and then he like whips out that ring and she's like well it's either marry you or be forever alone and i don't like that option so yes sunny does not know that rory is coming and via being the amazing girlfriend that she is has zero intention of telling him i don't even know what to say the pot is cooking man Bitch, that pot is empty ain't nothing cooking in there via put an empty pot on a burner on high and she left the building and that, my Panda Pals, is all I have for you today. I hope you guys enjoyed the ride. If you liked the video, please do consider subscribing and giving this video a big furry thumbs up. And if you want to help me please the algorithm gods, do me a solid, leave a comment down below and let me know your thoughts on this episode. I hope to see you guys for the next one. And as always, thanks for not letting me ride this train wreck alone. Bye.